Now we need to move on to look at the fin de siècle, or the, the end of the century. Um, over the course of the 19th century, there was just what seemed like almost an endless source of isms. Liberalism, nationalism, Darwinism, socialism, social Darwinism, communism, uh, romanticism, etc. Imperialism. It just goes on and on. Utilitarianism. Can't forget that one. Um, and what I want to do is try to explain how these isms kind of morphed everything um, over the long 19th century. Um, and whereas at the end of the French Revolution, or the beginning really of the French Revolution, um, where you had a, a split of the liberal left and the kind of royal conservative right, it shifts to a very new left and new right by the end of the century. And so in the next couple of minutes, I'm just going to try and make sense of that change and how those isms kind of fit together. So bear with me. Um, when looking at this graph, we start on the far left, right? Because our original system, if you will, was absolute monarchy. But at the beginning of the kind of long 19th century, being from the French Revolution all the way to World War I, we have the French Revolution. And with the French Revolution, you have a split. You have a split towards liberalism and its dual ideologies of free market capitalism and representative government, making up the left, making up the liberal or, or change or reform kind of movement. Whereas the kind of conservative monarchies, um, are considered to be on the right. And remember, the left and right was named so because of where people sat in the National Assembly of the original French government, sir, the original French representative government. Well, sticking with um, the left um, and the liberal left, what you also have at the same time is the Industrial Revolution and industrialization. Well, as you know, there was a reaction to industrialization and all of the the issues with industrialization and you have these socialist reactions where people want to reform where people want to provide um for the poor and everybody thinks everybody should be equal there was social darwinism which is the idea of a social survival of the fittest where the most equipped people will survive and get the most money and the most benefit and these will become your bourgeoisie and these are the people who should succeed and everybody who does not yeah they're gonna get stomped on but that's a natural selection if you will but at the same time there was another movement going on that we should note which is romanticism which is this idea of hearkening back to a simpler past and this romantic looking back at a different age an age of nights an age of simplicity and all of these are happening at the same time yes they are competing but they're happening at the same time but follow this out because with socialism being a concept that simply didn't seem to work as a practical level, you have this movement towards communism. And communism became what we would think of as internationalism, because the idea of a communist revolution was meant to be international. Um, now, that will become our new left, because that is our new change, because once liberalism becomes the, liberalism and industrialism become the standard, you need a new kind of change party. And that's where we see communism, out on the new left. We will see, um, uh, in Germany, the S. DP party form in 1875, in Britain the Labour Party form in 1893, um, and in France the Socialist Party. They they were very much stating what they were. All of these were kind of um, these new centristic parties um, with the more communist extreme parties on the far left. But those centristic parties that I was referring to, we need to understand who they are. Because people believed in liberalism, people believe that those who could succeed and get ahead should. 
social Darwinism. But they also believe that people shouldn't suffer, that people shouldn't be left behind, that maybe people need to be cared for. Things like welfare, right? And these people were called liberal socialists, or in this country we call them uh, social liberals, right? Because we don't like the socialism term. This is that new center. This is that Labour Party, the French Socialist Party, the German SDP. This is the system of government that dominates the U.S. as well as most European countries right now. This is the center once you get to the end of the 19th century. Um, some people like to call it free market with a heart. Whatever you want it to be, this is the one you're probably most familiar with. But we need to go back. Now, we need to go back to this lower corner and look at that nationalism on, I'm sorry, the conservative monarchy on the right. Um, with colonialism and the exploration that goes on in the 19th century and the fact that we have this new thing called imperialism, what you see is that that nationalist idea, that nationalist idea that maybe should be led by one person or a king, this is what Bismarck was talking about, um, can be best expressed by how much a country controls around the world, hence imperialism. Well, this was the, the kind of right side. This idea that what's important is not everybody having a say. What's important is the strength of a country, be that as a monarchy or be it whatever. Well, by the end of the 19th century, uh, nationalism moved beyond just the fact of one leader. Nationalism was more about the, the people and how do you take that further. Um, well, obviously you build off imperialism, you build off nationalism, but you also take this concept of romanticism, this concept of taking the stories of the Brothers Grimm and the concept of a simpler side and, and the culture, innate culture of a place like Scotland from Sir Walter Scott, right? Um, and then you adopt that concept of social Darwinism, that concept that those who actually are destined and more equipped to succeed will. And you can apply that not just to individuals, but you can apply that to nations. And if you have a strong nation, a strong capitalist nation that succeeds and people who succeed more than any others, then they are destined to be the best. And this is what I call capitalist ultranationalism. It's this new right. It's this new concept of conservative, which is not wrapped up in kings anymore. It's more wrapped up in economic success. Now, we understand the new left, right? This builds off of that kind of concept of uh, the Paris Commune in 1871 and these Marxist ideas, right? But the new right, and strangely, can be best summarized when you look at things like this. When you look at things like the first Olympics, 1896, you have a modern Olympics, which is not about individual greatness. It's about national greatness. Suddenly, you have these very individualistic events like track and field, which is what most of these early Olympic events were, where you don't matter as much as your country matters, and you are there representing your country. But what we see in this new right is the new right really attracts kind of young people, especially those in college, because they look around and they think, well, you know, I'm not going to be successful enough to be the great industrialist, social Darwin industrialist, the great titan of industry. But you know what? I certainly can't identify with the proletariat, those people who want communism and want to rise up and have everything equal. I don't want that either. I'm, I'm this middle class guy. I'm going to be a middle class person. I don't fit in either one of those camps. And they start looking for an identity of their own. And they find it in nationalism. And nowhere speaks to this more 
than in Germany. And the creation of these middle class dueling societies or dueling fraternities, please note the scars on his head. And these dueling clubs, these college dueling clubs, become a way to have yourself included. Um, you will note it became a badge of honor in the late 19th and early 20th century to have these scars on your face. Yes, he, he is bleeding from his face. They would actually pay people to um, stitch them up unevenly because it's a badge that shows who you are. And what's interesting is this picture was taken about 10 years ago. These dueling clubs still exist, and please note, they still keep their heads uncovered. Um, this will be the age in the United States where the Masons kind of rise back to prominence. This will be the formation of college fraternities. This will be the formation of the Elks Lodge, the Knights of Columbus, the Moose Lodge, um, all of those men's societies, all middle class people proud of their nation, but wanting to find their place. Back to our isms chart. We have our new left in communism. We have our center in liberal socialism. We have our new right in capital ultranationalism. But as we move into the 20th century, what we have to realize is that that communism new left will result directly in the Russian Revolution. And it is that capitalist, ultra-nationalist fervor for let's produce, let's show the world that we are the greatest people, not just place, but people in the world, will result in what we know as World War One. But that we'll pick up with next week.